Well, good evening, everybody. And it's really great to see, I think, 39 people on this evening and my dog, who's now desperate to be on screen with me. Um, apologies if you can hear her. So my name is Jo Crotty. I'm a professor at your university. I'm also director of Knowledge Exchange and director of the Institute for Social Responsibility, which is hosting this evening's um, <clears throat> book launch. The Institute of Social Responsibility was launched in 2019 to capture research and activity that pertains to the broadest definition of social responsibility, both inside the university and crucially outside. This evening, I'm really excited to be introducing Dr. Philippa Holloway to you and the launch of her book, The Half-Life of Snails. And I'm sure she's going to explain to you why it's called that, though I did look up um, The Half-Life of Snails a couple of days ago um, to see what that meant. Um, Philippa joined us um, during one of our lockdown events uh, where we screened a film about our love affair with the atom and of course the atom has come back now into a sharp focus as it probably is going to be one of the only ways we can meet our climate, cha climate change targets which presents us with some dilemmas. Uh, I also have my own background uh, with um, Chernobyl and Pripyat as I've been traveling to the former Soviet Union for more than 30 years and I've been there myself and also to the location of the 1957 Kishtim nuclear accident that was kept secret until the end of the Cold War in 1991. So this is particularly um, interesting for me this evening but tonight is not about me so I'm going to introduce our speaker uh, Dr Philippa Holloway, internationally published short fiction writer and academic former PhD student at Edge Hill University and now senior lecturer in English and creative writing at Staffordshire University, will be launching her book, The Half-Life of Snails, this evening, which is her debut novel. And it draws from her experiences both in the exclusion zone around Chernobyl and at Wilfer Nuclear Power Plant in North Wales. And living on the Welsh border, I'm also very familiar with that. So Philippa, I'm now gonna hand the floor over to you. Hello everybody and uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining me tonight and I am so privileged to be uh, doing this event with the ISR um, who are absolutely amazing and have been really supportive and to be able to be in conversation with some really good friends um, and colleagues and there's another writer Alex whose book The Chernobyl Privileges is um, another fantastic novel exploring uh, the legacy of Chernobyl and the traumas um, that have come out of that. Um, so just a little introduction to the book and a few little readings. Um, Joe just mentioned the title, The Half-Life of Snails, um, and they, you know, googling it, hopefully you just find the book because um, as far as I'm aware there isn't a specific um, study into The Half-Life of Snails. The title really is, um, it's riffing on two metaphors really, the idea of half-lives which um, is the way of calculating atomic decay and so over time um, different uh, radiations decay at different rates, some of them quite quickly, some can take thousands of years, so a half-life is when uh, how long it takes for that um, isotope to halve its emissions um, and it, but also there are themes of um, sort of decay and things disintegrating or falling apart throughout the novel, not just in a physical sense, because, for example, the landscape of Chernobyl um, itself since the disaster, uh, buildings and um, certain areas have kind of crumbled and uh, fallen into disrepair, but also in that kind of social sense or in the personal sense of um, a lack of control or things becoming out of control. So that's one of the themes in the book. Um, but the snails are also a really important motif throughout the novel. So um, it was my wonderful son who kind of gave me the idea for the snails. He had two pet snails um, around about the time I started doing my research. Um, and snails, of course, are creatures who carry their homes on their backs. Um, and they are um, also they represent in the book, they pop up at, at various times in the book, these, these two pet snails that one of the characters in the books has, the little boy Jack has two pet snails in the book. Um, they crop up as a kind of a metaphor and as a, a structural device really to help the narrative move forward. Um, so right at the start of the novel, we're introduced to this little boy Jack, whose mom Helen um, is a prepper. She's living on her farm in Wales. Um, which is under threat from the new nuclear power station Wilver 
um, which is buying up farmland and, and moving people out of the area so that they can build um, the new nuclear power station. Um, and she takes her son to her sisters to stay with her sister while she goes on her research trip to Chernobyl. Um, and she does this for two reasons. One, it's because she is trying to prepare him for her not being there. He's very dependent on her as a single parent and a single child. They have a very uh, close relationship, a very intimate relationship. Um, and so she's aware that because she herself is concerned about her health issues and how risky it is working on a farm, the, the sort of dangers all around, she wants to ensure that he's prepared and capable of being without her. So she wants to leave him with her sister so that he can learn those skills um, of staying with someone else. And also she she goes because she needs to face up to the thing that's caused her the anxiety since childhood, which was memories of the Chernobyl disaster and this the sort of the iconic um, representation of a nuclear disaster, which is the Chernobyl power plant itself. So she's going to push herself and to test herself as well um, in terms of mentally preparing. So as a prepper, she wants to not only be physically prepared, but she wants to be mentally prepared. And the snails are, are Jack's little friends, his little companions, um, but they pop up throughout the book to kind of represent certain themes and issues in the book. And I don't want to talk about that too much because I don't want to spoil the novel for anyone, but it's certainly something um, worth looking out for. Um, I think I'm going to do a little reading now just to give you a, a flavour of the book um, and you can start to get a sense of the characters. And I'm just going to read three short passages. Um, one is going to be from the beginning, so you can get that introduction to, to Helen and her son Jack and their life on the farm. And then I'm going to do a short reading from a section in the Ukraine and another short reading from a section in Wales to start introducing those two landscapes to everyone. So this is from chapter one. He is small for his age, only a month and a half into his second year at primary, not quite six. Goose grey eyes and jackdaw stick neck nest hair that makes him look smaller. She won't cut it, no matter how many times people hint or state bluntly that she should. Being different will give him strength in the long run. He clambers over the barbed wire topped fence, agile, careful not to catch his jeans on the rusting spikes, dashes into the field as if he is a wild animal released from a cage. He runs in a wide arc across the grass, head tilted to the sky as a murmuration of starlings lift, compress and dissipate before settling again in the next field. Helen watches him, her heart swelling along with the flock, standing here on the farm her family has owned for generations, looking out over fields of fat, pregnant ewes and wind-borne hawthorns, she can usually, if only for a second, forget. Helen uses her penknife to slice the bags of sheep feed open and she and Jack tip and spread the brown pellets over the close cropped grass. Do you remember why we give them extra food in February? For energy to grow their babies. Die down, Jack. Here, shake the rest out over there. Make sure they all get some. The ewes bump and shove one another, press together to get the best of the treats. She could become lost in these moments by the rhythm of them, the realness, if the threat of losing it all wasn't a constant itch like nettle rash in the back of her mind, if there weren't plans for a new nuclear power station to replace the one that has dominated the coastland since before she was born, land acquisitions and groundworks already under the way. She's been fighting the development from the start, tracking its growth, a steady creep towards the edge of her ancestral land, the requests to buy the family farm at more than market value a constant worry that taints everything, bitter on the back of her tongue. She won't give in no matter what, for his sake. So hopefully there you can uh, get a little sense of the landscape and the deep connection that Helen and Jack have to the land that they've been farming uh, for generations. Um, and I'm just skipping forwards ever so slightly to, to a little section where they're just getting ready to, to leave. Back in their barn loft bedroom, Helen sits on her haunches while Jack brings her folded underpants and bald socks, fleece pyjamas and a tattered book for her to tuck into his rucksack. Already it holds waterproofs, a water bottle and a hand-powered torch, high-protein snacks and a silver foil survival blanket neatly folded into a small square pouch. There is a list in carefully formed child handwriting inside a small brown notebook and after each item is carefully stowed, he marks a tick on the page with a stubby pencil. Think, she says when he's finished, is there anything missing from the list? 
He sways in his big hiking boots, rotates like a miniature scarecrow in the breeze, scanning the room for anything he's missed. Stops turning. Modron and Mavon. Get them then. He picks up a large pickle jar from the floor at the side of his mattress. It's half full of cabbage scraps and sticks, and somewhere underneath the leaves there are two large garden snails buried deep inside their shells. I'm ready. So these snails, um, they pop up every now and then throughout the narrative. Uh, they're named from Welsh legend Modron and Mavon. So um, Modron means great mother and Mavon means great son. Um, and in the Welsh legends, uh, the son is stolen from the mother um, and taken away and she has to fight to get him back. And so that is also represented in the book. There are um, perilous things for both Helen and Jack to negotiate as they as they go on their individual journeys um, and learn how to develop these mental and physical survival skills that they're both gonna need in the future. Um, I'm gonna jump forwards now quite a bit actually to Helen's experience of the Chernobyl zone. So um, prior to the Ukraine war, uh, the site of Chernobyl, the exclusion zone was turned into a tourist destination. And so you could book a, a tour around there of one or two days, stay in a hotel actually in Chernobyl town um, and take photos, go and visit the particular sites of interest, such as the fairground, for example, um, that has become an iconic representation of the Chernobyl disaster. Um, and as part of my research, I went and spent some time in the exclusion zone. I didn't go as part of a tour group. I paid um, one of the tour guides to basically act as a fixer. So he got me through um, various checkpoints. He made sure I was safe, but it meant that I could spend a lot of time in the exclusion zone kind of on my own to do that research that I needed to, to get a sense of what that landscape was like. Um, but one of the things we did was we went to visit a the visitor center where someone was giving a talk to a group of tourists um, and I'm going to show some pictures shortly so you can get a visual on this um, but one of the things in the visitors center was a like a doll's house of the reactor which I thought was a really interesting thing so this was before the new safe confinement unit was put over reactor 4 when it was still just the concrete sarcophagus um, so you could look out the window and see the old sarcophagus crumbling and falling apart but then inside the visitor center there was this well, let me read and you'll see. On a large low table, there is a scale model of reactor four, a morbid doll's house that opens to show the layers of destruction inside, tiny model men littering the roof and damaged rooms below. It's there, she thinks, buried, glancing through the window. She goes right up to the window, places her palm and forehead against the cold glass and stares hard at the reactor. She wants to be alone with it, wishes the room would clear and leave her behind. She's waited years to stand here, to face up to it. She never thought she'd get this close. Its osseous shape is familiar, burned into her memory. A vast pile of concrete blocks, hastily erected to contain the emissions. But here, in its presence, she can see it isn't quite solid. The surface is grey and pockmarked, like a sandcastle that might collapse, fractured. There are water stains streaking from the seams in dark tiers, rusty ladders buckled against the pitted flanks. Scaffolding props up the front. Ice and snow have caused fissures, and birds nest in the cracks. And it is leaking. She knows, but there is nothing to taste, smell or feel as it does. She presses her nose to the glass, and steam forms on the pane around her face. Memories surge through her. The window at home overlooking the lawn, the cherry blossom from the tree in the centre, exploding, falling. Instead of playing with the petals that spring, she'd watched the blossom drift and settled. It stuck to the damp grass and eventually browned, mulched into the lawn. Are you OK? She catches her breath, her fingers aching as they press the glass. It's Anton, frowning, dark eyes and thin lips. The room is emptying behind her. I'm fine. You got what you came for, yes? She looks back at the reactor, at the men working beneath it as though it is any building anywhere at the new safe confinement structure, sublime in scale, waiting to be slid across, another matryoshka doll to cover up the mess. I'm fine, she repeats, but he's already moved away. I'm actually okay. It will be dark soon. So there you got to meet Anton, who is a really important character in the book. He is a tour guide uh, for the Chernobyl tours. He's not her tour guide. He's a tour guide who 
recognise there's something in her motivations that are very different to the usual tourists um, and some connection with her, a, a sort of a deep and intimate emotional connection to do with that strong relationship to landscape and that need to keep going back into or returning to a landscape that you feel um, very connected to and that is part of your identity and I'm very aware of time I'd love to get on to talking to the esteemed guests we have today um, so I'm just going to read another very short piece because I think it's really important that we don't concentrate completely on Chernobyl but we also look at Wilver and how North Wales is reflected this is a contiguous narrative so uh, the two landscapes are mirrored as the story goes through the story flips backwards and forwards between what's happening at home in Wales and what Helen is experiencing in the exclusion zone so I just want to read um, a little bit about Wales um, so this is a point where um, Jennifer, Helen's sister, who's looking after Jack, has taken Jack to the beach, Chemice Bay. And from Chemice Bay, you can see Wilbur um, sort of across the bay. Um, and she's looking at some photos that Helen has posted online. Um, so she's looking at them on her phone while she's sitting on the beach. She flicks through the pictures with a chilly thumb. Dark skies, black trees, the heavy hulk of decaying buildings. She glances across the bay at the nuclear power plant, sees similar lines and angles in the grey of the reactors, the same colour as the sea and sky, looks back at her phone and swipes her finger for the next picture. Books open, pages crushed, softened with time. A glass jar, something suspended in yellow water, paint peeling. She glances at Jack as he sifts through the pebbles for shell fragments and sea polished glass. He has his back to her. A windowsill, dusty shards and curled brown leaves, a doll, dirty matted hair, leg missing, a tiny shoe balanced on the edge of a window frame, no glass, strands of grass curl inwards over the frame. Jack is moving away from her, absorbed in his search. He is making a low hum under his breath, punctuated by the winds snapping it away from her. Wilbur, from the other side, her side, she taps the picture to fill the screen. Dark low blocks of turbine hall, sand coloured sidings and slim back black chimneys, clouds low, a glow from the floodlight. She compares the real view with the images on the screen, sees both sides at once. She's never really paid it any attention. It stands out in the landscape, but it has always been there. She and Helen have grown up with its solid presence behind them in childhood photographs taken on the beach or sitting smiling on tractors in fields. They'd been on school trips and birthday parties to the visitors centre had never seen the horizon behind the farm without its even edges and evening glow of floodlights sitting between the curve of the headland and the flat line of the sea. She lets the phone drop into her lap and looks intently at the shape of the plant, the way the colours merge with the landscape, tries to see it as the photographer did. The mustard yellow of the turbine hall overflows into the dead bracken and grasses on the hill, foreshadows the blaze of gorse flowers about to erupt on the hillside. The dark chimneys in the base of the reactor block seep out into the black rock of the coastline and the pale green greys of the reactors billow towards the sea, the sky and seem to fall in fragments as tiny pale anemones growing between the rocks. She blinks in the sharp wind that races the waves and for a moment the edge of the buildings blur and she feels something shift inside, an awareness bloom into being like the spread of lichen. The building seems to flicker merging with the landscape one second, then standing out in stark contrast the next. She's never noticed its camouflage before. She shudders and looks around for Jack, sees the pile of shells he's tipped by her feet, but he isn't beside her. So thank you very much for listening to me read um, and explaining a little about the novel. I've deliberately not included any of the really exciting perilous passages because hopefully you'll read those for yourself and they might not make sense out of context. Um, but I'm really hoping that we can move on and start our discussion. So thank you. I think what we'll do is um, the, uh, to some, of the, some of the questions you've got in the chat. Um, the quicker you answer them, the qu the more we can do. But that you may decide okay, you only want to answer one. <laughs> so, first one, um, you set the you set the book the Ukraine part during the Maidan, um, but of course the Maidan has kind of been eclipsed now by current geopolitical events. So, uh, question one is: uh, Are you going to write a sequel? 
Yeah, lots of people who've read the book uh, keep asking me what happens next, you need to write a sequel. So I think even if it's just a little novella or long short story, I think I do need to do an update on this. I mean, I set the book, then I traveled to Ukraine shortly after the Euromaidan um, revolution. And, you know, those tensions were still echoing through the the, the cities and the, and the communities there. Um, and at the time, you know, I think like everybody, I just hoped that it was a, that was it and it had been solved and it's really heartbreaking actually now to see that that was just the trial run for what's happening now um and to see those places and those people the people that you know helped me with my research um displaced and you know trying to help their families back in ukraine as well um so yeah i will i will maybe have a go at that i'll keep you posted <laughs> okay sequel maybe um i won't ask if you had it optioned for um... <laughs> my editor it. just left the chat so i'll talk to her oh really <laughs> <laughs> uh, right next question um sometimes landscapes influence the shape of the story a river or a hill so you've got two sort of physical things in the landscape here so it, it, did you start with that perhaps I'm, I'm adding a little bit to the question here or or was it or did it or did it go the other way around or was it challenging to to have these power plants stuck in the middle of the narrative even though they're sort of key to it yeah i wanted to represent the fact that they're always kind of there lurking in the background without making them necessarily center stage and i hope that comes across there are points where the focus is on those particular nuclear power stations and the physical details of them and and those are really the two sections i read out today um but throughout the book there's lots of stuff that happens in the landscape and with the natural landscape, there is stuff to do with rivers, there's stuff to do with forests, there's stuff to do with farming. But in the background, there's always this kind of looming knowledge that these power stations are there, either dormant or waiting or potentially dangerous or or giving, giving energy, producing something that people need. Um, you know, for example, in Jennifer's strand of the book, you know, there's there's lots of the domestic use of electricity. There's a power cut. There's this recognition that the, the power stations are providing something while at the same time uh, potentially taking something away. Um, so that's a brilliant question. Yeah. And a lot of it I just discovered as I went along the way and, and kind of allowed those landscapes to guide the story and shape the characters and the narratives. OK, next question. Now, this, I think, requires you to explain what psychogeography is to somebody you just met in the bar in the pub so that it's clear to all. But the actual question is, who are your psychogeographer influencers? Who influenced <laughs> you? <laughs> um, that, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I went straight back to the source and started looking at Guy Debord and, um, you know, what psychogeography is, how it's used as a, a political and playful tool. Um, but obviously, it has over time changed and shifted and it's it's the nice thing about psychogeography is it's malleable you can take some of the principles from it that principle of going into a landscape defamiliarizing looking closely at how it makes you feel and behave um, and you can apply it in so many different ways and use it in so many different ways so there's authors who um who feel like they've used i don't know whether or not they're using psychogeographic practice but they feel like they have authors like sarah hall who in interviews talks a lot about um how she responds to the communities and the landscapes that she's familiar with. Um, so Sarah Hall has been a big influence. Um, and there's people who go out and write out and out psychogeography where they go for a walk and they talk about it. Um, so books like um, The Edgelands and, um, hang on, I've got them here next to me. The Unofficial Countryside and um, Edgeland's Journey into England Through Wilderness. Those have been really inf influential to me because really the landscapes that I was looking at were very much those Edgeland landscapes, you know, areas of outstanding natural beauty, forests, nuclear power stations, farms, power lines, all of these collisions of different ways of living and, and engaging with the landscape. Um, so those books in particular were, were very influential. Okay, next question. Having researched and written the book, are you more or less afraid of being afraid? People often ask me similar questions. Like, <laughs> oh, you went all the way to X place in the middle of Siberia, and then you went down to mine. So you mustn't be afraid of anything. But 
I yeah. am still afraid of rodents and small spaces. So yeah, I'm, um, I'm not keen on giant spiders. Um, <laughs> Right. No, I still have lots of lots of anxieties. I think in terms of my nuclear anxiety, um, it's still very much there. It's probably, you know, I understand it more and I can that understanding helps me to negotiate it, I think, and to manage it. Um, but yeah, there's lots of things that make me scared. But quite often when I'm scared of something, I just want to find out more about it and understand why I'm scared. So I'm that person who's scared of heights. So I go on a climbing course to sort of unpick it and work out, you know, what is really scary about this um but yeah that makes me sound much more hardcore than i am generally i can be found on the sofa with a book um but you know when it comes to research i'm up for anything i think um and actually i want to end on this question because it's i think it, it, it resonates with my own experience so my father worked on trident and polaris so he worked at fas lane for a period of time as Alex referred to and in Portland on Portland and I actually went on a nuclear submarine when I was very small I don't remember it but um my father did that for 40 years and he supported the family doing that so there are um conundrums to do with the nuclear industry in terms of scientific discovery in terms of jobs communities if we close Sellafield what would happen um, on the Cumbrian coast and so on. So it, it's complex. And having not invested in renewables, are we only left with renewables if we're going um, with that um, nuclear if we want to meet our climate change targets? So I wonder how you feel, uh, where you come down on that, and, and to what extent you you can see the whole the whole conundrum, despite the fact that I think the book leans in the sort of um, nu nuclear power stations not good. Um, yeah. Leans direction I was trying really hard um because I knew I was biased because I had this anxiety from childhood and I was trying really hard to unpick that and to to show the complexities of it the positives and negatives the the needs that it fulfills as well as the potential risks um and damages that come from it and I think I hope I've managed to do that I think you know it's up to the reader to decide whether they come out of it feeling more or less positive about nuclear power. Um, it's very hard when you start digging around in that research to, you know, and you and you recognise the complexities, um, not to have to stop and think much more carefully about those rather than taking a, a kind of an emotional response to it. And I think most people who are involved in, in nuclear things and, and do that, um, that research recognise that it is incredibly complex and people do have really complex responses to it. They have emotional responses, conceptual responses, practical responses. Um, it's about weighing up and trying to make the best decision. Um, so I hope that comes across in the book and that what the book does is encourage people to, to just go away and, and think about it. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's I think it's highly I think it's highly complex, um, and uh, my entire upbringing was rooted in that. And my mother used to say fantastic things to us as children, like, "Oh well, as we live here, in the first wave of the nuclear attack, we'll be dead," you know, in this kind of matter of fact way. So you know, nothing to worry about. Okay then. So anyway, on that happy jolly note, um, <laughs> it's now bang on um, six o'clock. I'd like to really thank Philippa um, for talking for almost the entire time, um, uh, which is no mean feat, and also for revealing parts of the book but not spoiling the book. For you for posing your questions, which I think are some of the best questions we've had on the webinar since we started doing them. So really good thanks to you and to Danny behind the scenes who's doing all the tech. So. This is the end of the formal proceedings, um, so I wish you all a good evening and go out and enjoy the sunshine if you've got five minutes. Thanks very Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, everybody, for, for making this happen. It's been wonderful.